So first things first this morning, um, I'm just the messenger, all right? So if you get hurt by what you hear this morning, don't shoot the messenger. Um, all I'm doing is delivering the Word of God, and if you will follow along with me, you will see that that is all I'm doing, is just showing you, thus says the Lord. That's it. When you walk away from here, you won't be able to say that I said this or I said that. The only thing you'll be able to say is, this is what the Lord said, and I either like it or I don't. And so um, I hope that and pray that you will have ears to hear this morning and a, a heart to obey it. So um, uh, please pay attention, and uh, God promises, Jesus promised, that with whatever measure you listen to His Word with, the same is going to be given to you in understanding and even more. And so I pray that you will listen with a big measure this morning, that you will be ready to, um, to respond to it appropriately. We are in Isaiah chapter 58, as I read to you earlier. Um, I hope that you got an outline. If, um, if you didn't, you can look it up on Wells Baptist Facebook page on your phone right now, and the outline for, um, for our sermon this morning is in there. Um, but basically, I want to give you a little context before we start. And so, for context, I want you to remember that the people of God that Isaiah is, is speaking to right here are being brought into judgment as a result of their sin. And so ultimately, the nation as a whole, I'm not just talking about that they're being brought into individual judgment. Right now, we're looking at national judgment that is affecting every individual, both the people that are righteous and following God and the people that are unrighteous and are not following God. And so ultimately, because of sin in this world, we all fall under the curse of sin. Amen? Even when you're saved, it don't mean that all of a sudden that you don't experience any suffering in this world anymore. Now I will say this, you no longer experience wrath. The wrath of God is removed from you, but you better believe that the trials and tests of faith will still come in forms of suffering. And so we still all experience the curse of this world as sinners, whether we are saved and born again, or whether we are unrighteous and we know God not at all. But He is speaking to an entire nation of people right here, people that are actually supposed to be believers, if you will. Supposed to be the chosen people of God, the, the, the people that have God's law and follow God's law. And yet, he looks at them and tells them that, I'm bringing you into judgment because of the sin that is in your lives. And we see that. I want to show you just a little bit of that in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2 through 13. I'll read these to you uh, very quickly this morning. He says here, and this is where he starts out in Isaiah. And you, sh- you may remember this. It's been a while back. But he said, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. So he's calling heaven and earth as witnesses against his people right here. And he says, the Lord has spoken, and this is what he said, Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, the donkey knows its master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people do not understand. All sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly, they have what here? Forsaken the Lord. That means they have turned away from God, right? They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. In other words, there is a separation between God's chosen people and God as a result of their sin. Thank you, buddy. Now we go to verse 5. Why will you be struck down? In other words, judgment is coming. Why will you continue in this separation so that you experience either the discipline of God for some or the wrath of God for others? He said, why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick. The whole nation. Everybody. The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. Now look at verse 6. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it. And this is going to be important to remember when we get to Isaiah 58, okay? Notice the picture that he uses. So he pictures a body, right? The head is sick from the head to the toe. It's all sick. So you got this picture of this man. Now let's see what this man looks like. 
There is no soundness in this man, but there's bruises all over this man, there's sores all over this man, there are raw wounds all over this man, and they are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. Y'all see the picture of this man? This is a rough looking man, ain't it? Your country lies desolate. In other words, now he takes it back to not just an image, but an actual picture of the judgment. Look at your country. Look at Israel to the north. Look at Judah to the south. Look what the Assyrians have done. Look what the Babylonians have done. Your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire in your very presence. Foreigners devour the land as desolate as overthrown by foreigners. And the daughter of Zion, here we're talking about the southern kingdom of Judah, which only 10% survives. And he says, the daughter of Zion is left like a booth in a vineyard. you got a whole vineyard and the only thing that's left is a single booth. And then it is left like a lodge in the cucumber field. In other words, Jerusalem is the only thing left standing in the kingdom of God. The rest of the nation of Israel has fallen. And he says here it's like a lodge in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. And then verse 9, If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, the 10% remnant, we would have become like Sodom and like Gomorrah. Do you remember what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Who was left? Nobody but Lot and his family. That was it. The rest of it wiped out. So hear the word of Lord, you, the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Here we go back to imagery again. You, you're looking just like them here. Hear the word of the Lord. Give ear to the teaching of God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices? In other words, you continue in sin, you continue in separation from me, but you're still coming to church, you're still giving your sacrifices, you're still giving your praise, you're still praying your prayers, you're still going through all the motions. But the problem is, I don't care about your motions. They're worthless to me. He says, what to me is a multitude of your motions, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and calling of convocations, I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. We'll stop right there. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. In other words, I don't care about your routines of worship. What I care about is obedience to my word. What I care about is you repenting of your sin so that you are walking with me. And we don't have any separations between us. See, we don't live in that kind of culture today. The culture we live in today is let's come to church and let's praise God and let's get our worship on and let's hear a good word and we'll shout and we'll amen and we're going to walk right out of here we're going to live the exact same way the rest of the world lives. And God is pleased. And God said, no. Mm -mm." He said, I'm sick of it. I cannot endure it. And we have to address it, is what he says. And so, I want you to be able to notice that he speaks to two groups of people by the time we get to 58. Notice in 57, verse 11 through 13. Let me read those real quick. Let's look at the first... The first uh, group of people in 57, so that we build the context, get up 58. Here's the first group. Whom did you dread and fear so that you lied and did not remember me and did not lay it to heart? In other words, you were living for the world, you were living for all your pleasures, and so and my fear was not in you, so something caused you to want to live uh, for somebody and for something else. So what was it? And then he says, Have I not held my peace even for a long time, and you do not fear me? So here we have this group of people that... They live, they come worship, they go through the routine, and yet they don't live for the Lord. And he says here, what is the problem here? I have held my peace. In other words, I have been so long-suffering with you. How many of you know God's been so long-suffering with me? But how many of you know that sometimes when you got a little kid and you're too long-suffering, what happens to that kid? They get spoiled. 
You can't be too long-suffering. And God's saying right here, I've been a little bit too long-suffering with you. I've held my peace for a long time to the point that you don't have any fear of me. But notice what He says. I'm going to declare your righteousness and your deeds. You're coming to worship. You're, you're praising the Lord. You're bringing your offerings. You're praying. You're fasting. You're doing all the motions. And I'm going to declare it. But notice what He says next. What? It ain't going to accomplish you nothing. Nothing. When you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you. What does that tell you about God hearing what you cry out? He ain't hearing it, right? The wind will carry them all off. A breath will take them away. But he who takes refuge in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. So here we got two groups of people, right? One group goes through the motions. They do all the right things, but... He don't accomplish them anything. Another group that takes refuge in the Lord for safety from His wrath. They follow the Lord. They trust the Lord in faith. And as a result of that, the fruit of that is obedience unto Him. And then, so now let's look at the second group of people from Isaiah 57, verse 15 through 18. Isaiah 57, verse 15 through 18 says, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy... I dwell in the high and the holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit. That word contrite means true brokenness, true mourning for my sinfulness. See, they're all on the same page of being sinners. The difference is one group comes in, worships, goes through all the routines, and acts like it's just a delight to be in your presence, Lord. I've got everything right, I do everything right, I, I've, I've got everything going the way that you would be pleased with. And then we got this other group over here that's coming and doing the same thing, but the difference is they know who they are. They know who they are. And God says, I dwell with that group of people. The group of people that is contrite and of a lowly spirit. And I do it to revive the spirit of the lowly. In other words, God don't mean to leave you in mourning, but you better believe that your sin ought to produce mourning in your life. See, we have this expectation today that you want to come to church, and if the preacher don't encourage you and lift you up and, and make you excited, then you, you, you don't want to be a part of that. No. You know, there was a time when people used to come to church and hear the Word of God and mourn over their sins. When was the last time you saw that? Now we come to church, we hear the Word of God, and we leave right out of here the exact same as we were when we came in. And God says, that, is not, that, that don't work for me, and it don't work for you. And so He says here, I dwell with that contrite and lowly spirit because I want to revive the spirit of the lowly. I want to bring you back to life, bring you back to reconciliation with me. I want to revive the heart of Him. He says, I will not contend forever. In other words, God's holding His peace. God's striving with you. How many of you know God's striving with you? God's wrestling with you. And He says here, but I am not going to contend forever. So I'm not going to wrestle forever. And I'm also not going to be angry with you forever as a result of your sin. For the Spirit would grow faint before me and the breath of life that I have made. There's going to come a day when God don't strive anymore. And then he says here, did I give you another one? Yeah, go to verse 17. Because of the, the iniquity of his unjust gain, I was angry. I struck him, I hid my face, and I was angry. But look what he did. But he went on backsliding in his heart. And he says next, I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. Not all of them. The one who is contrite and lowly in spirit. The one that comes in mourning as a result for his sins. The one that seeks reconciliation with God. The one that comes in here and hears his word and says, Woe is me, for I am undone. And you look at the word of God, you hear the word of God, and you apply it to your life, and you leave out of here bearing the fruits of repentance. That's what I'm talking about this morning. Let me explain something to you. God does not heal and God does not forgive without repentance you got so many preachers walking around here today preaching the message of God's unconditional forgiveness. Wrong. Wrong. If God's, if God's forgiveness was unconditional, the whole world would be saved. But they're not. 
We have to bear fruits worthy of repentance. You say, preacher, you're preaching a works-based salvation. No! I'm preaching a faith-based salvation. But how many of you know that faith without works is what? So you better believe. Let me show you some examples of it. I didn't give you all these scriptures, so if you can... I don't know if you can look them up fast or not, Nathan, but look up... um, Acts chapter twenty, verse twenty. Uh, Acts chapter twenty-six, verse twenty. Let me show you the difference in this. This may turn into a four or five week message. Amen. Amen. Look at this. Paul is preaching to the king of the Jews here, and he says. But declared first to those in Damascus the gospel, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles. And here's what he declared. Here's the gospel. That they should what? And now I want you to see something. Repent is not first and foremost works that are done. Repentance is a change of mind toward God. That's repentance. Repentance is, I see God's way, I see my way, I see the way my heart and my desires are toward God, and now I turn from that and I refocus my mind to understand that He is the only one worthy of my life. That's repentance. But then notice what He says next. That they should repent and turn to God, and notice what He says next. Performing deeds in what? Keeping with their repentance. So you see the difference between repentance and works? Repentance is a change of mind that turns to God. A change of heart that turns to God. And then you have the fruits of repentance. And that is the deeds that perform in keeping with your repentance. So you've had a mind change, you've had a heart change to turn to God, right? And now you have works in your life because of your mind change and your heart change that follow God. Can I give you a few more scriptures? Look at um, Matthew chapter 3 verse 8. Matthew chapter 3 verse 8. And this is what John the Baptist preached to, um, I believe it was the Pharisees if I remember right. But he told them to bear fruit in what? In keeping with repentance. In other words, the Pharisees were coming to John to be baptized like the rest of the people were. And that represented their repentance, their turning toward God. But then he looks at them and he said, Listen, this ain't about going underwater and coming back up. If that's all you do, you're just a wet Pharisee. But you should bear fruit that is keeping with repentance. So in other words, if your repentance is true, if your salvation is true, then there should be a change of life in you. But if all you do is say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you come to church like everybody else, and you go through the rituals with everybody else, but there is no mourning and no sorrow for your sin, there is no repentance in your mind and your heart, and there is no fruit that bears the, 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 that's befitting repentance, then I'm sorry to tell you there's a major problem. And that's what God is addressing here. He's addressing people like this right here. So we have these two groups and the difference between them is the true mourning, the true brokenness, the truly seeking God. They're not just going through the motions, they're fasting because they're broken for their sin. They're not just praying because they need things in their life, they're praying because they need to be reconciled with God. They're not just giving sacrifices and worshiping just because it's what we do. They do it because they desire God. And they desire to be one with Him. And that's the difference in the two groups of people here. So now go with me to Isaiah 58. And I want you to be able to notice that the focus of this chapter is, yes, it is on fasting, but in the details of it, you'll also see that he's talking to them about their prayer life, but because he says, fasting in this way will not make your voice be heard on high. So we're talking about fasting for God, we're talking about praying to God, we're talking about offering worship to God, we're talking about seeking God, but not with a genuine heart. And this is what we have to deal with here. And so we see that this is a a practice that God gives them. And basically, let me explain fasting in in layman's terms. I'm actually going to do a series on fasting here before too much longer because I believe that it's a practice that we have lost today and it is a very important spiritual discipline. Matter of fact, Jesus Christ Himself told um, told the, uh, the Pharisees and the disciples of John the Baptist, He said, 
that they came to Jesus and they said, why don't your disciples fast? We fast and the Pharisees fast. Why don't your disciples fast? And he said, listen, the disciples can't fast as long as the bridegroom is with them. Because remember, fasting represented mourning over their separation from God. And so, how do you mourn when God is walking with you? But Jesus told them, He said, listen, there's going to come a day when I go away. And when I go away, then they will fast. Because there is that separation again. And so ultimately, what we see in this is that fasting is a practice that is still part of us today. Uh, Jesus also told, uh, told His people, He said, don't fast like the Pharisees fast who want everybody to see their fast. But instead, when you fast, and you can go look at it up and read it for yourself. I think it's Matthew chapter um, 8 somewhere in there. But He said, when you fast, not if you fast, when you fast, you do it by fix your hair, put oil on your face, go out and you do it in a way that nobody recognizes that you're fasting, but it's between you and God. It's you mourning because of your separation from God, because of your sin. So in the, in, in the, the process of mourning, it should lead us to, to repent from sin. It should lead us to put on fruits of the Spirit. It should cause us to, to draw closer to God. And yet, when they were doing it, it was just a process they went through and it didn't accomplish any of that. And you'll see that as we go through this. So start with me in 58 verse 1 through 2. And notice what he says right here. He says, cry aloud and do not hold back. What's God asking Isaiah to do? Man, let it go, buddy. <laughs> Preacher, let it rip. Give it all you got with this because this is important. And then he doubles down on it and he says, Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Cry loud. Lift your voice up like it's a trumpet. And he says, Declare to my people their transgression. God wants you to understand what your transgression is. And he says, Declare to the house of Jacob their sins. And look at verse 2. Yet they seek me daily. They come to... Listen, how often do you seek God? Some of y'all weekly. Some of you monthly. Some of you maybe daily. And so I'm not saying that everybody isn't out of a genuine heart seeking God, but let's just be honest with us. We're creatures of habit, and how easy... Have you ever fallen into a routine of just going through the motions? I've many times, many times I have fallen into that routine. And here, people like me are being called back by God and He's shouting, I want you to hear this. I want you to understand this. And notice what He says next. They seek Me daily. They delight to know My ways as if they were a nation that did righteousness. They come to Me. They come in the church uh, as, if, as if we've got everything right. As if I, I, me and God... We got, a, we got an agreement. Everything is fine. I'm good where I am. And then notice what he says next. He says, <clears throat> they, as if they did not forsake the judgment of their God or the ordinances or the laws of God. They ask of me righteous judgments. In other words, they, they're asking me to, to do right by them. <laughs> they're asking me to be good to them, to bless them. They even delight to draw near to God. These people actually maybe even, they even like, enjoy coming to church. They may, be, they may like what they get when they get here. But then, notice the question that's asked in verse 3. Why have we fasted and you not seen it, God? God, we're going to church. God, we're praying. God, we're worshiping. God, we, we, we seek you. God, we read your word. God, we're going through all the motions. And yet it seems like you just ain't hearing nothing we're saying. You ever felt that away? And then he says here, Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no pleasure in it? Why, why are we doing this, God? What's the purpose behind it? And then he says, Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure. There's no mourning for your sin. There's no desire to seek me with all of your heart. You're not coming and doing your spiritual disciplines because you want to be close to me. 
This is all about you and what you can get from me. This is not about our relationship. Not only that, but in the process of it, notice at the end of verse 3, you don't, you don't end up getting closer to God and bearing fruits of repentance, but instead, look what happens. You oppress all your workers. You go out and you're, you're just as sinful. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight. You don't become more humble. You don't become more gentle. You don't become more patient. You don't become more long-suffering. If you are truly mourning for your sins, if you're truly recognizing the separation between your ways and God's ways, then it ought to be producing something in you that says, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be angry and frustrated and I don't want to be this overbearing husband and this overbearing father and, and this, um, I don't want to be this person that I want to actually put on the fruits of gentleness. I want to put on the fruits of kindness. I want to put on the fruits of long-suffering. But instead of that, they're going out and they're oppressing their workers and they're oppressing their families. And then notice what he says next in their fast. In verse 4, Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. It just produces anger and frustration in your life. And I've seen that in my times of fasting in my life to where I get so... It's kind of like... Um, you ever been around somebody that's trying to quit a nicotine habit? I hear some chuckling, so I'm going to take that as an amen. What usually is the attitude coming from that person that's trying to fight a, a fleshly addiction? <laughs> Frustration, anger. And so the difference is this. Whenever you are fighting the flesh and fasting and you're trying to seek God and draw closer to God, then it ought to humble you in those things and it ought to cause you to become more gentle and more long-suffering and more patient. So their fast wasn't producing anything because they weren't truly seeking God. They were just going through the motions. Everybody tracking with me this morning? All right. Now go with me to... Um, uh, verse, the end of verse 4. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice be heard on high. In other words, your prayers are not getting no further than the top of your head. They don't even get to the ceiling. You heard that expression. I don't think my prayers are getting past the ceiling. They ain't even getting to the ceiling. He said when all you do is go through the motion, your prayers ain't getting no further than the top of your head. That's as far as they go. And then in verse 5 he says, Is such a fast that I have chosen a day for a person to humble himself? Not take pleasure in it, not do your own things, not, not uh, it be uh, content in your sin and continue to sin even more. No, it's a day to humble yourself, to recognize your sins, to recognize who you are. Is it a day to bow down his head like a reed? You know what a reed would typically do once it gets so tall and it gets so big and its head is so big? That reed begins to do what? It just bends over until finally it breaks. And so he says it's a day for you to, to bend over and to not let your head get so big but to, to break over. And then he says it is a day to um, bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes and under him. And this was just symbols of their heart. And so all of this was when they would take sackcloth, and sometimes they would wear sackcloth, which if, if any of you have ever had a potato sack race, you know what sackcloth would have felt like. And so ultimately it's very uncomfortable. Ashes were a places of your burnt garbage. And so you are putting yourself in the lowest place because you're recognizing how sinful you are in light of God's righteousness. And this was a day for you to do that. To actually seek God in recognizing your sin. You know, it's kind of like uh, one of the things that I, I like to do when I pray at my job where I work at... Um, in my office, if I want to pray, I usually try to find the nastiest place on the floor. And I get on my knees there, and I put my face to it. Because it is a way for me to express in my heart where I truly stand in my sinfulness coming to an almighty God. That is forgiving. That is my Father. That is, that, that, that is loving and kind. I'm not saying that. But at the same time, I recognize who I am. And I recognize how that makes me mourn that this is the kind of person I am. 
And it deepens my worship. It deepens my prayer. And this is similar to what they did in fasting. They wanted to do things and have symbols that expressed what their heart actually felt toward God during that time. And so they are spreading sackcloth and ashes under them. And then he says, will you call this a fast, a day that is acceptable to the Lord? Well, if all you're doing is just those motions, then no. But if in those motions the genuineness of your heart is a desire to repent and to seek God. See, we have gotten too comfortable and too okay with just being in our sin. We have become a culture that uh, we don't have shame for sin anymore. That's the reason why it's so easy to walk into the church and, 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 and it's just an easy thing. We don't feel no shame. We don't feel no guilt. We don't feel no, uh, no sorrow for it. The truth of the matter is we don't even really recognize our sinfulness anymore because the culture is okay with everything that I do. And as long as the culture is okay with it, then you know what? God must be okay with it. Can I tell you something? Just because the culture changes its standard does not mean God has ever changed His. The Bible tells us that God is the same yesterday, today, and how long? But yet our culture has taught us and trained us that these sinful things in the eyes of God, that God's just okay with. God's okay with. And I tell you, God has not changed. And so we have to come in here with an understanding that God's ways and our ways are the distance, as He said, like, like between heaven and earth. It is, an, it is a distance that can't even be measured. That's how far away they are. And that ought to produce in us a mourning and a sorrow for our sin. And so what are some examples of what they're missing? Look with me at verse, um, at verse 6 again. Is not this the fast that I choose? And he names what the fast is supposed to do. The fast should loose the bonds of wickedness. It should undo the straps of the yoke. It should let the oppressed go free. It should break every yoke. So in other words, the fast is designed for you to express a sorrow for your sin and in that, God empowers you to be able to overcome the bonds of wickedness that hold you hostage. You wonder why we are so weak Christians today? The truth of the matter is we're missing this this spiritual discipline. We really are. And it served a purpose in this time. And it still serves a purpose today. But and, and if there's some of you in here that your flesh is already crying out, if I was to, to say, hey, I want us to, to start fasting as a church, your flesh goes, oh. Yeah, I just don't know. That ought to be evidence to you of how powerful that spiritual discipline really is. Why do you think your flesh cries out and says, I don't want to do that? And it's because your flesh knows exactly what it could accomplish. But anyway, so we're looking to loose bonds of wickedness, not to create more wickedness. We want these bonds of wickedness to be loose. We want these straps of the yoke that holds us bondage to be loosed. We want the oppressed by sin to be able to go free. We want every yoke that has us in constraint to be broken. And ain't that what a Christian wants? I do. Now, I don't desire it like I should, but the closer I'm drawing to God, the more I want that in my life. And he says here that this is the fast that I have chosen for that. So what are some examples of the yokes? Well, selfishness was one of them up through there. Covetness, uh, no compassion for the poor or the hurting. In other words, not they, they were all selfish. Everything was about me, 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 and nothing was about loving others. That's the point. And how many of us fall into that routine that our lives are nothing more than just about me, me, me? I've just got to make sure that I have everything I want, that my kids have everything that they want. I've got to make sure that we have a house that everybody looks at and goes, wow, look at that house they live in. I've got to make sure I drive a car that everybody looks at and says, wow, look at that, look at that car they drive. Or I've got to make sure that everything I do is about my pleasures and about what I want and about what, what makes me happy. And this is exactly, and and you don't even care what it costs anybody else or what damage it does anywhere else as long as you are took care of. 
And this is what you see throughout Isaiah whenever you, you read some of these. For sake of time, I'm not going to take you through some of those scriptures. But another thing that we see, if you look with me, let's look at just a few of the verses in Isaiah 58. Look at Isaiah 58 verse 7 and you'll see a little bit of it. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh? So in other words, here's what they were doing. They had brothers and sisters out here that were, didn't have clothes, that uh, were struggling to hang on to their houses. And if you were to go back to Isaiah chapter 3 and Isaiah chapter 5, you'll see that they were actually taking advantage of them and they were buying up these poor houses and making them homeless. And they were adding house to house and land to land. And they were driving their own brothers and sisters out of the land. And God said, I can't believe that you call yourself a Christian. I can't believe that you call yourself a child of mine. I can't believe that you say that you walk in my love and that you've experienced my love, and yet this is the way you treat your own flesh and blood? Something is missing. And so He says here that what I would have you to do in this fast is to come back to sharing your bread with the hungry, to bring in the homeless poor into your house. When you see the naked, to cover him, to not hide yourself from your own flesh. And then you can see the same thing in verse 10. If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted. I also want you to pay attention as we study this, all the if-thens. Now what I mean by that is when we get to these promises, they all start out with, if you do this, then this is what happens. If this, then this. If this, then this. But you can't expect the then if you don't do the if. And again, you say, preacher, you're preaching a works-based salvation. No, I'm not. I'm telling you that faith without works is dead. And so if you have genuine faith, and you have genuine love for God, then what's going to happen is that these fruits are going to come from you. And if these fruits come from you, which shows genuine faith, then this is going to be the result of it. But if you don't have genuine faith, then you better not expect that any of the thens and these promises are going to apply to you at all. So there is responsibility on your part to have genuine faith. And as you have genuine faith, it will result in fruit that befits repentance and works that prove that your faith is not dead. So those are just a few things. I want to show you another one. Look at verse 13. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, so remember, here's what they were saying. God, we're fasting and we're going to church and we're praying, yet you're not hearing us. God, we're humbling ourselves, yet you're not answering our prayers. And so, what are they saying about going to church on Sunday? What's the point? It's not a delight. I mean, God ain't hearing me no way. God ain't doing nothing for me. God ain't answering my prayers. God, God's not, I ain't experiencing nothing of God. So what's the point? And he says, if you will call the Sabbath a delight, how do you do that? By not doing your pleasure on my holy day, and all of that, and the holy day of the Lord you call honorable. If you honor it, not going your own ways, or seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly, and that means speaking ill about, it would be like this. How many people do you think in the world today got up, Christians that got up and said, well, you know, I just don't want to go to church today. I'd rather just stay in the bed today. Or how many Christians do you think got up and said, well, it's raining and it's gloomy. Yeah, I just don't think I'll go today. How many Christians do you think said, oh, we got to go get up and go to church in the morning. I got to get up at 8 o'clock where I can be at Sunday school by 9.30. All right, you see what I'm saying? He said, why don't you call the day of the Lord an honorable thing? Why don't you call the day of the Lord? Is God not worthy of a day? There's some people that say, boy, I sure hope the preacher ain't long-winded today. <laughs> Y'all better quit praying that prayer. God ain't going to answer that today. I'm just telling you. This preacher going to be long-winded today. 
This preacher lifting up his voice like a trumpet today. And so, there are some people that, that would be that way. That was, if we're not out by 12 o'clock, then, then going to church today was just, a, was just a miserable day. As long as I get out and I get to be able to spend my time with my family and I get to do this and I get to do that and I get to... That's what he's talking about. If you will turn your foot back from that and you will call a day that we come to worship the Lord and go through our worship with Him in a genuine heart, if you will look at it and you'll call it honorable, you'll quit speaking wickedly about it, then these promises will apply to you. So these were just some of the things that they were doing and it all came because they did not have a heart that genuinely wanted to seek the Lord, that was genuinely sorry for their sins and wanted to have a reconciliation with God. So let's look at the first promise this morning. <laughs> number one. Number one. The first promise comes from verse 8. And look what he says. What's the first word of verse 8? Then, then shall your light break forth. In other words, if you are seeking me in a way that accomplishes verse 6 and 7, then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall, spread up, shall spring up speedily. So here's the first promise. If you will genuinely seek the Lord, and you have a heart to repent of your sin, and you have a heart to turn to Him, then He promises that your light is going to break forth. What does that mean if you're waiting on light to break forth? Where are you at if you're waiting on light to break forth? And so here he's saying that those that are in a spiritual place of darkness, those that have been basically separated from God because of their sin, let me prove to you that I'm interpreting this right. Look with me at Isaiah chapter 59 verse 1 and 2. Because Isaiah 59 is basically an interpretation of what he's talking about in Isaiah 58. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. In other words, you're going through the motions, you're in a terrible place of spiritual darkness. Guess what the good news is? God ain't got little short hands. It's not shortened so that it cannot save. Or His ear is not dull that it cannot hear your prayers. And then look at verse 2. But, here's the problem. Your iniquities have done what? It has made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you so that He what? He does not hear. Now here's the thing. I'm not talking about a separation for Christians as in you have lost your salvation. But the Bible does warn us that you can grieve the Holy Spirit, that you can quench the Holy Spirit. The Bible warns us that you can strive with the Holy Spirit. The Bible warns us that you can lose the joy of the Holy Spirit and the Lord. You can, you, you can lose the, the, uh, the peace of the Lord in your life. The Bible warns us that your prayers, even as a Christian, can be hindered. And so even though you won't lose your salvation, you can create a separation between you and God because of the sins in your life. How many of you as a Christian ever experienced that before? And he says here, your iniquities have made a separation between you and God. So the first point that he means when he says that their light is going to break forth is he wants them to understand that you are going to come out of that spiritual darkness and you are going to be reconciled with God. This separation that causes your darkness is going to go away. And how does it happen? Through a genuine heart that is contrite and lowly and seeks the Lord with everything in you. And notice what it says in verse 8 of chapter 58 again. Notice how this comes. Then your light shall do what? Break forth. And look at the picture that it has here. Like what? Like the dawn. Now here's the picture. You're sitting here, you're waiting on the sun to come up. The night has been so long. And now you're waiting on the light to come up. And God says through this 
process of genuine faith and genuinely seeking me, God is ready and waiting like the sun is to break forth at the dawn. And so what you see in this is that we're not talking about a slow process here. Let me tell you what he said to us in 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. 1 John chapter I think that's correct. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 I believe says this. Here it is. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to do what? Cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. You need to understand something. See, you're sitting there in your darkness right now, and you're like Peter. After he denied Christ three times, they came back to him and they said, Hey, uh, we saw the risen Lord. And Peter and John were together, and the Bible says that they both ran, but Peter was outrun by John. Y'all ever noticed that in the Scriptures? Do you think it was because John was actually faster than Peter? No. What do you think happened? Peter really wasn't in that big a hurry to see him, was he? Because the last time that he had looked into the eyes of his Lord, what had he done? Denied him three times. And how many of you know that when you're in a place of spiritual darkness, that when you're in a place of unrepentant sin, <laughs> You're not in a hurry to get back to the Lord. And yet God says, I'm in a hurry for you to get back. And if you will do these things, then your light shall break forth like the dawn. That's a beautiful picture that Isaiah paints for us there. And if you don't receive it, it's a lack of faith on your part. That's it. If you don't repent of your sin and come back to Him, it's because you love the darkness more than you love the light. I'm sorry. I told you I'm just the messenger, right? You have a choice. You can either walk in the flesh or you can walk in the Spirit. The choice is yours. And so you either believe God and you either want light to spring forth in your darkness or you are so in love with the darkness that you love it more than the light. And the truth of the matter is, I'm just going to leave it there. You know what the truth of the matter is. So the final picture, notice the next picture we have in verse 8. Not only that, but he shows a picture of what reconciliation with God looks like. And your healing shall spring forth speedily. You remember the picture we saw in Isaiah chapter 1 of this body that had wounds all over and bruises all over and the, the wounds weren't bound up but they were oozing infection? That's right, I'm going to make you sick this morning if you've got a weak stomach. But that's the picture that God gives you of you and your sin. And He says here that if you are contrite and lowly in your heart and you genuinely seek Him and a reconnection with Him, the promise is your light is going to break forth like the dawn and all those wounds are going to be pressed out and healed up and bandaged up. And then notice what he says next. And your righteousness shall go before you. In other words, what's going to lead you is you walking in the righteousness of God. That's what's going to lead your every step and your every path. And then notice what's behind you. And the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. And here we have a picture from Exodus chapter 14. I'm not going to read it for you, but the, the point was this. The Egyptians were coming on to the backs of the Israelites as they were trying to get to the promised land. And yet, the Bible tells us in Exodus... Um, I can't remember the, the verses right now, but it tells us there that basically God moves from in front of them to behind them in a cloud. And He stands between the enemy that's bearing up on them and between them as they're being led forward by Moses. And so here we have this picture of them being led in the ways of God and being protected from behind so that as the enemy pursues you, because how many of you know when you're trying to do righteousness, what's the enemy doing? He's coming after you. He's coming after you. But I thank God that in Romans chapter 8, verse 33, He tells us, Who is there to condemn? It is God who justifies. 
In other words, no matter what the enemy comes up behind you and he tries to say and he tries to do, the fact of the matter is God is your rear guard. And these are the promises for someone that is lowly and contrite of heart and is not just going through the motions but is genuinely seeking God. That's number one. That's the picture. Absolute restoration is what you see in that. Now, number two, unhindered prayers. I'll go through these just a little bit quicker. But look with me at verse 9. See the next promise. Then you shall call and the Lord will what? You ever felt like your prayers really don't get no higher than the ceiling? Come on, somebody. And he says here that there are so many things that can hinder prayer in a Christian's life. Let me show you just a few of them. Look at Proverbs chapter 28, verse 9. Proverbs 28, verse 9. If one turns away his ear from hearing the law or the Word of God, even his prayer is a what? You come in here and you don't want to hear the Word of God, you don't want to hear what this preacher has to say, that's okay. That's all right. But you better know one thing. If you don't want to hear from God, guess what? God don't want to hear from you. That's just the truth of it. Let me show you another thing that hinders our prayers. Psalm uh, 66, verse 18. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would, would what? So you've got sin that you cherish in your heart that you won't repent from, that you won't turn from, that you just keep hanging on to. He says, okay, that's fine too. But guess what? I'm not hearing your prayers because your sin makes a what? A separation between you and me, so that I do not hear. Look at another verse with me. Uh, 1 Peter, because I want to make sure you know this ain't an Old Testament thing. This is a New Testament thing too. 1 Peter 3 verse 7, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Not talking about spiritually weaker, but a physically um, and the way they're built, a weaker vessel. And so he says, Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that what? In other words, if you're an overbearing husband, if you, are, if you are not showing fruits of righteousness at home, you're not repenting of those sins, you're not mourning for those things and turning to God, the promise is this, that will cause your prayers to be hindered because you're cherishing sin in your heart, whether you believe it or not. That's tough, ain't it? Come on, some, some husband already said, Oh, is me. Woe is me. I mean, that's the truth. That's the truth. A few other scriptures, I'll quit. James chapter 4, verse 2 through 3. You desire, you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And then look at verse 3. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So there again, what hinders my prayers? When I'm all about me and I'm not about being right with Him. One more and I'll quit. James chapter 1, verse 5 through 7. <clears throat> if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask. God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But look at verse 6. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Now here's what he's talking about. He's talking about asking for wisdom, all right? Why do you not doubt? Because God has promised in His Word that He will what? He'll give it. He ain't saying that every prayer you pray, you ought to name it and claim it. I'm sorry, that's not the way God works. Do I wish that's the way God worked? You better believe I wish that's the way God worked. I wish I could just name whatever I want. God say, as long as you don't doubt, I'm going to give it to you. But that's not the way it works. The Bible says, whatever we ask according to His will we can rest assured that He hears us. And He will give us whatever we ask for when it is according to His will. And so He says that as far as the person that's doubting the Word of God, don't let that person suppose that he will receive what? Anything from the Lord. If you have doubt in your mind about God fulfilling His Word and His faithfulness and His trustworthiness, you better not think you're going to get nothing from Him. 
And so there are many things that can hinder our prayers. But let me tell you, the beautiful thing about a person that is contrite and, and may fall into every one of these categories. I've been there. And yet, He promises to the one that is contrite of heart, to the one that is genuine in his heart, to the one that mourns over his sin and humbles himself before God and seeks God with all of his heart and begins to bear the fruits of repentance and trusting that God does forgive and that God does cleanse of all unrighteousness. He promises that when you call to Him, I will answer. There will be no hindrance whatsoever to your prayers. That's a pretty important promise right there. I don't know what you think about it, but that gives me a lot of motivation to not have a separation between me and Him, but to pursue Him with everything in me. The next thing is in verse 11 of 58. <clears throat> and I'll stop on this one, because I believe these are the three that really apply to us more than anything else. Verse 11. And the Lord will guide you, what? You ever been at a place in your life that you just don't know which way to turn? You don't know what to do? You don't know what decision to make? The Bible says right here that when we are in this type of relationship with Him, genuinely seeking Him, Genuinely sorrowful for our separation between us and Him. Not coming as if we are righteous and as if we've got everything right. But if we will genuinely do this, the promise of God is that I will, the Lord will guide you continually. This is important too, because notice that word Lord. It's all caps, right? This is the name of the great I Am. The self-existing one. The one that is... From the beginning and before the beginning and the one that knows the beginning of a thing all the way to the end of a thing. The one that stands above the maze and he sees every roadblock. He sees every path that leads to the, to the prize in the middle. The one that knows all things. The Bible says, He will guide you continually. That's a pretty good promise if I, if I say so myself. And so, the, it's kind of like this. Keep, keep reading with me in verse 11. Notice what that looks like. Whenever we're guided by the Lord continually, we are satisfied in our desires in scorched places. In other words, we have the, the desires that, um, that, that, that not, not everything we want, but I'm saying that when we're in a dark, and when we're in a place of, um, of desert land, if you will, we're still satisfied. We're still satisfied. And then he goes on next and he says, And we will, I'll make your bones strong. Again, we have this picture of this man that didn't have strong bones but was being broke down. Why will you be destroyed, he said. And then he says, And you shall be like a watered garden. Not only are you going to be strong and healthy and satisfied in, in, in desert lands, but at the same time from you is going to come living waters. From you is going to come this same satisfaction in God and people. Are, you're going to be a witness for the Lord in this. And then he says in, um, at the end of it, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. This is going to be a result of you. And this is basically what David experienced in Psalm 23 whenever he said, The Lord is my shepherd. And what did a shepherd do for sheep? They continually guided them. They protected them. They satisfied them. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I what? I shall not want. I'm satisfied. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. So you know the psalm. But the, the point being is this is the kind of satisfaction and the continual guidance that we experience whenever we are that way. And remember, every one of these promises are dependent upon your genuine faith in turning to the Lord and the evidence of that is going to be produced in the fruit in your life. So in closing, seeking God is more than just going through religious routines. That's important. Because I truly believe that there are many of us today that fall in the same category. All we do is just go to church. We stand up, we sing, we 
We pray with the prayers. We say our amen. We uh, listen to the word. And yet we walk out of here and nothing was changed. Everything's the same. It's more than just praying. It's more than just worshiping. It's more than just fasting. It's more than just learning from His Word. It's about sorrow for sin. How many of you know that you are still a sinner? And that your sin causes a separation between you and God. And yet, how many of us wake up every day and we feel no sorrow, no remorse for our sin? And he says here that the one that is contrite and lowly in heart the one that is fighting their flesh and they're drawing near to God in His ways, they are the ones that are receiving these promises from God, not the rest. You can read the rest of the closing there, but maybe you're here today and you are one of these that going to church on Sunday, you know, it's just more of a burden than it is a delight. You don't get up like, like David said and said, uh, we were so happy when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing at the gate waiting for the doors to open. No, but instead it's just a burden. Maybe you're one of those that, um, like I was talking about earlier, you, you continue in the sin of being overbearing and... and um, you don't treat your family right. You're not a good husband. You're not, uh, you're not a good father or vice versa. Wife or, or, or mother, whatever the case may be. Maybe whatever it is, there is some sin and darkness in your life that you are still cherishing and holding on to and it has caused a separation between you and your God and all you're doing is just coming to church. you got two choices. Or you got three. You can... Just keep doing that, and then there will come a day that he'll quit striving. There will come a day that he'll be done. Or you can let this light of your darkness break forth speedily. You can watch those wounds get healed. You can have your prayers get answered. You can have satisfaction in desert places. That choice is yours. You can decide what you want this morning. There are so many examples that we can look at. But if you know that you're just going through the motions of religion and there's no real sorrow for sin and repentance and obedience, today is the day that you're being called out by the Word of God. Not me. I'm just the messenger. Y'all understand that, right? I'm being called out too. <laughs> i got the same choice you've got. If you know that there is a separation between you and God because of the sin that's in your life, you know that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Today is the day that He bids you, I desire to be reconciled with you. All that lacks is your repentance. All that lacks is your faith in my word and for you to come to turn to me with a heart that is sorrowful for the sin and the way that you are and bear fruits that prove that, that say that, that demonstrate true repentance in your life. And the promises of God are yours. Your light will break forth in darkness. Your Healing will spring forth speedily. You will be satisfied. You will be guided continually. And your prayers will not be hindered. That is the promise of God. And you can either believe it or you cannot believe it. The choice is yours.